um, as I go through these things, there are these notes written on the on the bottom in pink, which are just for me. So please don't look at those notes. I don't know how else to put them on there. And this is just what I've done. Uh -huh. uh, this just remind me what, what the point of the picture was. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so as Robert said, uh, my area is in precision measurement, and I think to the, if I heard that and I wasn't doing it, it would sound a little bit dull, because it sounds like someone's just adding another decimal point on something, and who really cares about that sort of thing? Um, yeah, I mean, mostly true, 80% true. Um, and, you know, we like to feel that we're precise and we're doing these sorts of things, we're measuring things that are really tiny and then really large, and we're doing it very, very well. And, you know, the reason we're doing it very well is it's not just, it's not always just a contest of who has the most digits of whatever in the thing that they publish, but the hope is that, uh, hope is that we're gonna find something new. And I would say, uh, this is a sort of introduction, introduce myself a little bit more. Um, there's a, there's a funny dividing line between uh, who we uh, accept as a sort of validated scientists whose words that we trust, sort of, um, and people who we would label as crackpots who are far out there doing things like making perpetual motion machines in their shack. And I'm like, really more like a, like a crackpot, but then by some, you know, twist of circumstance, I happen to in academia where I have this label uh, so people listen to me sometimes but spiritually I'm more like a crackpot but I'm I'm here doing stuff which is less crackpot um, and one of the ways I think we justify uh, not being a crank is we talk about the precision and the seriousness and the rigorousness with which we, with which we do things um, and it's not just a matter of who has what degrees but there's a whole formalism um, to how we uh, professional scientists talk to each other and there's keywords and, and body language and uh, graphics and things that you use to sort of signal that you're, you have a high level of seriousness. Um, this is seriousness in the David Foster Wallace uh, sense. He, I, I'm also from that, that part of the country. And so when he says seriousness in his writings, I know exactly what he means. It's a person who's, uh, you know, when the Midwestern terrors of snow and whatever come in, a serious person is someone you can count on to have supplies for you and that sort of thing. And that's also what we mean by a serious scientist, I think, is someone who's um, into these sort of uh, dull details of how many digits and fineness and so on of the measurement. Anyway, we like to think that. Um, and is it, is it really true? Uh, I would say the angriest Angriest emails I get, or when giving a public lecture and someone comes up to me afterwards, they have to do with the fact that uh, people believe that uh, we as scientists are, have some sort of conspiracy going on, where there's where we really discovered really exciting truths out there, but we're keeping it from people because there's a we have some sort of vested interest in the status quo of science. Um, but this picture is a little bit more really what everyone's going for. Nobody, nobody really wants to be doing this kind of thing. Everyone wants to be doing this kind of thing, where uh, there's this myth that we grow up with, that there's the hero scientist who is, uh, you know, fights against peers and the establishment and the common wisdom and has these eureka moments. And, the, and there's all kinds of, you know, after you have these, you know, which are not really eureka moments, you polish the story of how it really happened. And you make it sound like that later, so it makes it for a good story, and then people believe that story and strive for that kind of thing. But uh, everything I've, I just want to, probably shouldn't say this, everything I've ever done, I feel like I've never had a really original idea in my life. Um, it's just always been something that's in the air, going around and talking with people and hearing things. And occasionally I'll say something, which is really just uh, 20 different conversations that I'm kind of merging into one, and someone else will say, wow, that's a, what a creative, fantastic idea you've had. And I say, uh, it's just sort of a gumbo that I've mixed together out of these things. Um, and as science gets bigger and bigger, this is, I mean, I, I don't want to say that we're never going to have those moments again, but it's more and more the fact that um, there's people all across the world who are doing little pieces of work which they think are pointless uh, or 
you know, they try to fluff it up so it, so it seems better, but in their hearts, they know that it's an incremental thing on the mountain of scientific knowledge, but they're really hoping for a moment like this. And so I would say, except for a few really stodgy, stick in the mud, you know, tie pocket protector types, um, nobody, nobody wants to uh, fortify the scientific establishment. Everybody's hoping for this kind of moment where they're, where they're seen in this life. Um, this picture though is, this is a, I don't, this is a sort of controversial picture. A lot of scientists show this picture when they're giving talks. And I think none of us really know where it comes from. Um, it definitely wasn't colorized like this when it was, when it was allegedly made as a woodcut. Um, and I don't even know if it's really an ancient picture or not, or if it's a modern one that someone's made to look old. But the concept is that, you know, on this right-hand side, this is the universe we know and love and that we find some secret inner workings about what's going on. But largely speaking, this new universe that we found is made up of familiar things like flashing things, wheels, and so on. But this whole idea that we'll be able to express this new discovery in the language that we've picked up, you know, over hundreds of thousands of years uh, is not, it's just, it's foolish. Uh, So one, one of the things I want to try to communicate today is about why it's so hard to communicate about these things that we're finding out. And I have a lot of trouble even, uh, it's a, a good image to have in your mind. Um, you may imagine um, two androids sort of facing each other and having a, a discussion, which is just a bunch of binary blips and bloops and things like that. And it's a little bit like that to me when I go and talk with my the most mathematical colleagues I have. When I watch them go at it together, I don't really know what they're talking about anymore. Um, and I feel like probably that also happens to other people when they you know, hear me talking to somebody about some super technical thing. It, it's more and more that the, that the language that we have to discover the latest discoveries, which are the most challenging mentally, uh, we just can't do it anymore so far. It's not to say that it can't be done, um, You'll hear often scientists say that I can't explain it to you without a lot of mathematics. And that's not really, uh, there's nothing to that except they haven't tried hard enough or they haven't met somebody who can um, talk to them in a way that helps them express that idea uh, without the shield of mathematics. This is a sort of attempt to uh, describe some discoveries about fundamental particles and quantum physics and that sort of thing. Uh, but this picture doesn't really tell you much, I guess, besides maybe there's something exciting on the left and then there's a mess of things on the right. But what, besides that, you know, I don't, this is not to criticize the Argo National Lab. I'm sure whoever drew this had a lot of, uh, um, put a lot of work into it. Um, I, probably some, many of you have heard that speech, uh, this is water. Right, it's a commencement address, David Foster Wallace thing. Maybe, maybe not. All right, you can look it up later. Um, I would say th this is an accurate representation of where we are in science, trying to move forward. Um, everything that we've grown up with is the basis of how we describe all of our future discoveries. And so we think about things that are macroscopic, like the size of ourselves. And you can imagine this, what is the smallest thing you can imagine uh, it might be pollen or a piece of talcum powder. And the biggest thing that you can maybe imagine and feel is uh, maybe a city or a skyscraper or that sort of thing. And these scales, they go from maybe uh, one ten thousandth the size of the human body to something like 10,000 or 100,000 times bigger than the human body. But if you really want to understand what's going on in the universe, there's a lot more zeros required on all those ends. And I'd like to be able to tell you that after 20 years of working in science, I've developed a knack for doing that kind of thing, but it's, it's really not true. I, I can, you know, in my gut, I can only really understand things that are similar to the scale I'm familiar with. And one of the reasons we have this sort of obfuscating language of uh, jargon in science and uh, complicated mathematics is to allow us to you know, extend beyond what our language normally tells us about. Uh, and so what I imagine in this picture, uh, these are scientists, 
uh, without their lab coats on, and this is what they this is what they do mostly, is they live in this world they're familiar with. They travel around. They talk to each other maybe a little bit, and and what we're hoping for is this moment where somebody says, "Hey, you know, I'm going to go up here and see what's going on up there," and. I cannot imagine what that conversation is going to be like when the fish comes back down and tries to say, mm -hmm. you know, I've gone into a realm where there's no water. And that fish will come back down and try to talk to the other people at this conference and say, hey, there's this thing out there. There's no water. They don't even have a word for water yet. Water is just uh, the way we would, for example, describe what space and time are. That to us is not a thing that you need to describe. You know, if you go if you go left, you've gone left. If you go right, you go right. And there's things about geometry and logic that we just assume are natural and built into the way everything works. There's nothing, there's nothing that you can do to get around that fact. And for fish, water is like that. Uh, they don't have words probably for things like what are the molecules that build up water. But the things that we are really looking for in science at the next step, which we're not actually succeeding in, is to find out something like what are the molecules of uh, space and time. What determines the rules of mathematics? Like really, you know, you, you, keep, you, you keep going through this exercise of peeling back the layers over and over, but um, here's this priest doing this, but this is not the whole picture, right? If you keep going to the left, there's gotta be somebody else who's already living in this world trying to move to the next one. And eventually uh, you have to get down to the bottom where uh, there's no more new thing to move into. Um, you've seen, I think you've seen and you, you've heard things about uh, the so-called dark matter and dark energy. As an aside, I just want to say, um, uh, these are just the worst words. These are just the worst. Um, the most misleading things maybe you could hear about. Um, neither dark <laughs> matter nor dark energy are dark. Why do we pick dark? I don't know. This all happened before I started. It's not my, not my fault. Um, dark matter has been a, oh, I don't know, 50, 60 years now or something like that. It's been a going thing. Um, and you see the evidence for it over on the right. Um, those blobs and things are galaxies that are far out. And the idea is um, this warping that you see is something that you would get, you would get uh, if you just took a photo and you put a glass lens in front of it. And so it, this is exactly the same, but instead of lensing due to the fact that the light is passing through glass, there is lensing because it's traveling through a piece of space which is warped in the way that uh, a piece of glass is curved. So the curvature of the glass bends the light rays, the curvature of the space also bends the light rays. Same, same stuff. Um, in this case, there's a smiley face. What does a smiley face mean? It means nothing. It means nothing. That's the... Uh, fundamental lesson of the universe is that just like you can look at clouds and you can find bunnies, you can find someone's name if you want to, um, the universe is big, um, even bigger than the earth, it turns out. And if you look out at the sky, there's a lot of smiley faces out there. There's whatever patterns you want to, it's pretty much out there. So we found this thing, it doesn't mean anything except the fact that the thing that's causing the warping of space and time which is due to gravity, we believe, uh, is invisible. And so the right word might be invisible matter. However, another thing probably someone should, should say, uh, I hope is, this is not being recorded. Is this? I can just, all right, so let's assume this will not be recorded. Um, we have been looking for this dark matter since before I was born. There is zero evidence um, no one's found anything besides this kind of smiley face stuff. There's a lot of evidence if you look out into space that gravity is happening and things are weird, but no one knows at all that uh, there's any matter out there which is dark or invisible. But it's just a, a thing that just keeps on going because uh, we haven't ruled it out. But it doesn't mean that it's actually true. Um, this on the left is, a, is an, uh, to give you an idea of the fraction of the universe which is bright and dark. And so the bright jelly beans are us. We're all the stuff like atoms that you can see. And you, and you understand, like, there's a proton and there's an electron rolling around it and that sort of thing. Uh, dark jelly beans are the rest of the things, the so-called dark matter, but it's not. It's actually invisible. So the right picture of this would be a bottle of jelly beans, which is mostly just 
empty and a few bright jelly beans. And we really don't know what's going on beyond it. And so you have probably heard in the popular press things that uh, like dark energy is 75% of the universe. Well, maybe, you know, maybe not. It's just a thought. Um, there's some evidence that the universe is expanding in a different way than what we thought. And we've said, this is the dark energy. But really, I mean, if we were being honest, we would say um, things are behaving in ways that we didn't predict. And we have our usual theories of the cosmos, astronomy, cosmology, and that sort of thing. And none of it really fits with what we observe when we look out into the universe using our telescopes. And uh, as sort of fudge factors to make it all fit, we've invented these ideas of dark matter and dark energy. And we are hoping that some experiments that we'll do, hopefully now, maybe 100 years from now, maybe 1,000 years from now, will give us a little bit more insight into these things. But we are not yet at that level. And it's, it's gonna, this whole, the rest of this is gonna sound a little bit like a rant, but that's the kind of, that's the kind of mood I'm in. I'm at that kind of age where I'm questioning, you know, what, is, what am I doing here? What, what's this all about? Is this all a sham? And I know we can go into the laboratory and shoot lasers and things like that, and I can produce a lot of plots and I can write equations and things, but is this all leading anywhere? Or is it just, we're just sort of like scrambling around in the dark and telling each other stories that don't make any sense? And I, I don't know. I, I was wondering about this last night. I still don't know. Um, but I'll share with you my latest thoughts. Um, a lot of what's going on in um, when people communicate science to the public is this kind of garbage, which is, uh, and I think it started probably in the early 60s with the rise of uh, bringing voodoo into quantum physics. Uh, physicists for 30 years or something like that had uh, done experiments which seemed counterintuitive, and they started to, to bring up phrases like everything is connected, and if I look at something, it changes anything, and the universe doesn't exist unless we're observing it, and phrases like this, which there's no evidence for and, and there's no support for, and I think really it's just done um, to make sound bites that are, that are uh, appealing. You say things like that, people want to hear about that. They want to know that there's mysticism at the heart of uh, you know, regular atomic physics that like make up this podium. But that's just not true. There's no such thing like that. It's just, uh, these are stories that have been made up. And I'm, uh, I'm from the mid, and originally I'm from the Midwest, but really grew up mostly in uh, central Florida and uh, Northeast India which sound like different places. Um, they have several things in common. Um, everyone eats fish. Um, and there's a lot of mosquitoes. It's very hot and humid all the time. So coming to California, it's like a dream. You can go outside and not be bitten by mosquitoes. Um, but the other thing that we have is this. I don't know what you want to call this here. But um, when I was visiting my grandfather in India, a lot of the commonly, commonly, there would be this kind of guy up here on the top left. And he would have, he and his gang would come around and um, tell you all kinds of stories about what was going on and how he could fix the various things that are probably wrong with you, even though you don't think there's anything wrong with you. And it's not exactly snake oil, but it was various other things like you got to put your hand on top of this flame for a certain amount of time and do these rituals and so on. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we have the same sort of thing going on in a number of areas which have to do with um, health, wealth, wellness, consciousness, and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, it's not to say I'm not a, I'm a scientist, but I would say I'm not a scientismist or something like that. I'm not saying that uh, there can't be new discoveries coming from people who are not uh, seen as official by the scientific establishment, but. Um, what bothers me a lot is the relationship between this and this. And that these days what I find is that often, you know, the, usually the public figures that you, that, you, that you see and that you hear who are talking about what's really going on, what's, what's going on at the frontier of physics, there's a lot of hucksterism in the whole thing. And I don't know all of these people personally, so I can't tell you if this is really uh, 
something that they're doing intentionally or is something that it's just sort of an unconscious way of padding the story that they're telling you. But it's something that we have to guard against, that we don't have, uh, we don't have a continuing, uh, I don't know, this is not to be, meant to be a political statement, but you know, we've seen in the last uh, dozen years or so that a lot of people taking uh, public office who don't really have any qualifications. And it's sort of the conflating of someone who uh, feels something is true in their gut and talks about it as if it's true with something that's truly true. And uh, the word elitism, you know, elitist and elitism has become a bad word. Although really what we want probably uh, when you, you know, elect someone to maintain something like the national power grid, you probably do want someone who's an elite power grid expert to do something like that. And in the same way, you probably want to get your health information. And um, if you're so inclined, you want to get your cosmos information, as important as that is to you. You probably want to get it from a reputable source, and not someone who's uh, a sham. And here I, you can see the pink words. Um, I decided to not put the graphic on here because it was too graphic. Uh, there's, for the Indian males in my, uh, my family line, there's a procedure that we have to undergo before puberty, um, which is a kind of, it's another test of your seriousness, as, as DFW would put it. And it's a, um, there's some markings of the flesh and there's uh, fasting, prayer, and this sort of stuff. And each gen and of course, in each generation, we tell the next generation that whatever you're undergoing is a, is a very much watered down version of how we had it back when I was a kid. And things were really serious and knives and stones were used and that sort of thing. Um, and, an, and there's an analog for it in the modern days for science, which is the PhD program. <laughs> and you get into that program and you're given a stipend, hopefully, uh, which is just, it's just sort of at the minimum. You can get by on the ramen noodles and spaghetti and uh, bread and toast and free food on campus. And we all learn to behave in that way. Uh, and then you work 70, 80 hours a week and you do it for six or seven years. And it's supposed, as far as I can tell, I don't know, I've only been through it once, but as far as I can tell, it's the same kind of process. Whereas, you know, if you wanna be seen as a serious person and a member of this village, then you had better go through this process to show that you can handle it. And it's a kind of gatekeeping that we do. And I'm not really in favor of gatekeeping, but I'm in favor of having people who are working on serious problems have a level of seriousness. Although I, you know, I wish it hadn't been done to me, of course. Um, and one of the things I have to say is that, we, you know, you can talk a lot about these ideas and you can, these sorts of things where you look at, uh, here's a picture of the universe and we think this happened and here's the Big Bang and that other thing happened. How much of this image do you think is really true? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm showing it to you, but I, I just don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure this is not like, like it's shown. Um, from here, this is probably true. And right at the end, where we are, that's probably true. Um, you know, yesterday, Jan 11 showed this picture of the uh, black hole that was the image of the black hole that was all over the news uh, from the Event Horizon Telescope. And it makes you think when you look at an image like that, this is not to attack Jan at all. It makes you think when you, when you look at that, uh, that someone looked out there and they actually saw a picture of a black hole like that. It's not really what happened. It's, it's more like, uh, we ask you all to say, let's turn off the lights and close your eyes and imagine all of you, and you, all of you imagine something different about what do you think it looks like, a black hole at the center of the galaxy and what it's surrounded by. And then um, we show you a strobed image of it, like you're in a Halloween fun house where you only get like one image every 10 seconds, like a strobe. Um, and then so you use these brief glimpses of what's going on there and then you tie that into your own, your own mental imagination. And then afterwards you draw a picture of it. And, that, and that's actually what's happened. But that sort of thing is not really a thing that scientists usually want to tell you about because that's, the, that's how the sausage is made. And it's, not, it's a much less satisfying picture. 
yesterday when Jana uh, played this sound of the black hole merger, it was sort of a beautiful whoop kind of sound. It makes you think that that's actually what the instrument produced, but that's not at all what the instrument produced. More, I'll, I'll do the impression for you right now. The instrument sounds like <laughs> all the time. And in the middle of it, we had a sound, imagine that sound is playing, and in the middle of it, we had a, a sound that was like, <laughs> that's it, that's short. There's no whoop, there's no chirp, there's no nothing. And so that's not very mediagenic. You know, there's this noisy thing and there's a thud. And is that what, you know, a billion dollars of your tax money we've used to make this thud and this noise? Yeah, we have. And since then, there's been um, 20 more of those thuds. And, you know, if we just, if we just play for you some thuds and some noise, you, you don't want to hear about it. Um, and so the process of extracting real scientific information about black holes um, is a complicated one that uses a lot of dull statistics and mathematics and mathematical modeling and so on to produce these sorts of things. Um, and the frontier, you know, how do we do better with these things? The frontier is really in doing precision measurements. And um, with precision measurements, it's all, I would say, arts and crafts at the end. Uh, there's no way to fake it. You have to go and do your craft several years, dozens of years. I I've been doing it 20 years, and I'm still working on uh, the physics of glass. This is uh, me at a um, glass workshop, glass blowing shop here in uh, Culver City. And this is a, a mug I've made to make fun of this picture of cosmology. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't tell if you're laughing at, at cosmology or my attempts at making a mug. Um, and, and so it matters. The way that we do our most uh, precision measurement is by hanging our instruments uh, by glass fibers. So this is a zoomed in image of the, of the device that we used to make the first gravitational wave uh, discoveries of black hole mergers. And it re requires us to make um, glass fibers which are thin. Um, we're holding mirrors that are about half of my wave and we're hanging them by glass fibers which are about a 10th of a millimeter wide. And I don't know about you, but if you, when I have a multi-million dollar mirror suspended by a tiny, tiny thread of glass, it makes me very nervous. Mm -hmm. And right now there's something like 16 of those hanging and I'm just, I'm just hoping and hoping that there's not an earthquake that's gonna smash these things. Because they're very, have you ever tried to break a stick of spaghetti? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know how it doesn't break into two pieces. It just goes all over the place. Yeah, yeah that's what happens with these things too. And it's because you crack this thing and the acoustic shockwave travels throughout it and shatters the glass and millions. it's a big mess. Um, but this is, this is the kind of, this is the example. And, and here's me uh, uh, making some of these with a hydrogen oxygen torch uh, and then looking at, uh, looking at a few of my first fibers over there. Um, this is the kind of, this is an example of the scientific hucksterism I wanted to highlight to you. Um, I've just learned how to do this. I, I'm a complete amateur. There's no way I can actually make the glass fibers that we need to do scientific discoveries. You, to do something world-class where you can measure black holes from halfway across the universe, you need, to, you need to have spent thousands and thousands of hours making these perfect, perfect glass fibers. I, I spent sort of like 100 hours on these things. So anything that I made, it would be like um, it would be like trying to play a string on a violin or a guitar. And if that string was a different thickness all the way up and down, and if the surface was all damaged, it would just sound like an awful, it would sound like a banjo with plastic strings. And that's, that's not anything anybody wants to hear. Um, so beware, uh, I'm, I'm just as bad as all the rest of the scientists. Um, we, I think one of the things which is now out in the air um, in the science media is the fact that our experiments are costing a lot, um, you know, even adjusted for inflation. They're all at this billions of dollars scale. And it's really asking a lot of people to say, or, yeah, asking a lot of a lot of people to say, hey, we've got all these problems in the world that we'd really like to fix, but, you know, won't you, uh, 
give us something like for, for the next one, it won't be one billion because that's old already. One billion was a thing in the 2000s, but 10, something like 10 billion, 15 billion. Um, won't you give us 10 or 15 billion dollars that we can do these things and find out something about black holes or something about the Big Bang or something about the alleged dark energy in some part of the universe? And it's tough to really ask for that kind of thing, especially since the rate of new discoveries in science is sort of uh, uh, coasting now. We're not really having um, wonderful new discoveries every year, at least uh, at the fundamental level as we used to. And the cost is going up. We've discovered a lot of things about the universe, but as we go, in, as we go further, it may be that we're running out of headroom in terms of the things that we can access using the powers of humanity on the earth. Even if we were to say, uh, let's shut down all military activities and put everything into this, you know, what's the, the grandest discovery we could discover? Um, we don't really know the answer to that, but the answer eventually may be, that's it. You know, in order to, to find the next particle, you, need, you may need to make a particle physics uh, experiment, which is the size of the solar system. And the budget for that will be difficult to pass through Congress, I think. <laughs> and if I tell you something like, I need to make a, a diamond mirror, which is the size of New York City, in order to detect something about black holes, you may say, you know, why don't you go back to your chalkboard and do some equations? Um, so most, mostly scientists will complain about funding and, and will not tell you things like, uh, maybe we're sort of, you know, we're scraping at the bottom of the barrel now. Maybe there's not much left for us, what we can access. Um, but really, I would say the deficit in scientific discovery is not about money. It's about uh, new ideas. And I don't know, I, scientists, I never, get a, I never get a good response when I say this, but uh, not many scientists here, so I'll just say it. Uh, it's not that scientists are not creative as a whole, but I, I definitely know many scientists who are very non-creative, and then there's some few who are very creative. Um, but the way in which we really wanna make the new scientific discoveries is to have an injection of uh, creativity and new ideas, and how are we gonna do it? Um, it won't be by 50 of us going to a or a hundred of us going to a conference and sitting around talking to ourselves. Um, you know, the amount of neuroses and psychoses that I see among my colleagues is uh, it's varied, um, but it's gotten to the point where it's comforting. I go into a conference, it's sort of like going into an old house with furniture you used to, like, oh yeah, there's that, that psycho and there's that psycho. And it doesn't really matter where in the world or what's the topic, but all the, all the personalities are on display and they're there. And, you know, we can, this is this echo chamber of us talking to ourselves and we keep doing that for a while, but um, we really need to mix it up. And by mix it up, I mean, we have new kind of scientists, but we don't want to limit the idea of scientific, uh, we don't want to limit the input of scientific ideas to just people. We want to have new, new kinds of people contributing into this field. And that's why I think this kind of art science uh, symposium is so important just to get people together so that we can exchange ideas and then it sort of, at least leads you into new kinds of thinking. Um, one of the ideas which I think nobody, also nobody likes, um, it has to do with this, this person on the right, Godel and his incompleteness theorem. And he was talking about mathematics and saying that um, there are certain ideas in mathematics um, which you can't prove using mathematics. There are certain concepts that you'd like to prove but you can't prove. And not only is it true about mathematics, but it's true about all kinds of logic. So you can come up with a system and all kinds of rational systems, you can make conjectures about that world that you can't prove using that logic system. And that was such a, I would say, it was like a, such a spiritu spiritually painful blow to all mathematicians and theoretical physicists in the 20th century. Um, it meant something like, uh, we can't go on in this way forever. We cannot have an infinite realm of discovery using the tools that we have and the tool that we have is this thing on the left, right? The human brain. And I recently started working with a company to do a, uh, you know, computer brain interface. It sounds, this is why I called myself half trackpot. This sort of half trackpot idea. Um, but we'd like to be able to interface with the brain 
and to extend uh, the realm of thought for ourselves and start doing things where we can sort of spur creativity in new directions. And the other side of that is, is over on the right. Um, we'd like to think that we have a special place in the world. We'd like to think that um, somewhere there's a difference between this laptop and myself, which is not just complexity. And we'd like to think that, okay, if I came up with a laptop computer that had as many uh, uh, neurons in it as I do, that that still would be somehow missing the vital spark of essence and creativity and humanness that I have. And that no matter what you do, how many uh, transistors you put together, you'll never be able to make um, a, a, real, a truly creative new idea or a wonderful piece of uh, mathematics or something like that. You can just not do it using these artificial means. But it's, I think it's about time for us to drop that idea, um, just like we would if we were, uh, um, yeah, like this. Um, <laughs> so uh, what do all these pictures have to do with each other? It's hard, it's hard to know. Um, <clears throat> this is a tardigrade. It's a little animal. It's about a tenth of a, maybe a, a few tenths of a millimeter long. Um, these are a couple of uh, uh, human-sized creatures um, doing regular human things like soaking in a hot tub. And that's, that's uh, one of these uh, racial stereotypes from the cartoons of the 1980s when I was growing up but as a Native American who can grow to be the size of the planet. Um, one of the things that makes uh, new ideas in science so spooky for us to access is just because of the scale that we live at. Um, for that giant on the right, I mean, were he to be real, um, things like static electricity don't matter. Because when you're that big, when you, when you become the size of the planet, the only force that matters to you is gravity. There's no more little magnets and things that matter to you. These are all microscopic issues. We happen to live in a very special scale where, you know, if you do something like this, um, the static electricity bothers you and you may look like this. Um, and if you get even smaller to this size, you're now in the realm where gravity doesn't really matter for you anymore. All, everything that matters to you has to do with uh, clinginess at the microscopic level. And so I will say to you that Although all this stuff about sp spooky quantum physics and what's really going on seems to be uh, difficult for us to grasp, it's not necessarily that true that it's going to be difficult to grasp for everybody. Um, and if you grew up um, like this, this one on the left here, um, for you, that would be totally natural. And you would never have said, what is dark matter and what's dark energy, because those are things that are just not in your universe. But there's all kinds of things which is uh, in this universe, which we are just not I mean, we're kind of exploring using our tools, but it's not, it's not that um, important to us yet. So I wanted to close with this thing. This is sort of the, I think the state of, you know, my impression of the state of science. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, when I was in grad school, I went to the uh, MFA in Boston and I found this, this thing um, put there. It's a, I think this is actually about the real science this screen, so you're getting the real experience. Um, but this is this work by Gauguin, which um, I think, and you should read it from right to left. Uh, this is sort of, in science, we're, we're kind of at this left, left hand side here. So on the, on the right hand side is the, uh, and for those of you who have read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, this is a parallel with the three levels of civilization. And I think, as it said in that book, um, to, to paraphrase this, uh, the first state of existence is um, how shall we eat? Um, and then state number two is something like what shall we eat? And the highest level of existence when you reach true Zen is uh, where shall we go for lunch? <laughs> and science is sort of at that where shall we go for lunch stage where, yeah, we've got things, we've got light bulbs, we have lasers, we have aeroplanes. Um, that's all very exciting. We even have smartphones. But now we're in this spiritual sense. And uh, I'm, I'm like this over here with my head in my hands, saying, uh, how, how much longer will business as usual go on? Do we have to really do something drastic? Or uh, 
Should we just cross our fingers and hope that the scientists hanging around their conferences and writing papers to each other will really be able to take the resources that we give them to do this work and make uh, the next great leaps that we, that we are kind of counting on? Or is it that we're gonna to have to do a more drastic rethinking of how discovery is done and make sure from now on, um, not only that they're educating the next generation of scientists, but also bringing in uh, creative people from all different areas in order to make sure they're doing the, the best they can with what we've given them. And we, I think we as a, uh, we as a people need a more transparent insight into the scientific process and a little bit more uh, say in how it's done. And uh, I was going to say something like you should call your congressman and ask for that, but I don't think I don't think that's going to work. Anyway, you should call whoever it is, uh, and you know, put on a mask and go protest out in the streets and ask for a scientific uh, revolution. I hope. Thank you very much.